Good afternoon. This court is resumed. Or I'm sorry, this hearing is resumed. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm now going to, as promised, uh, deliver my judgment in respect to the application by Steve Norn for issuance of new subpoenas. This is an application by Steve Norn, a member of the Northwest Territories Legislative Assembly, to have a number of subpoenas issued. The subpoenas requested include Dr. Andy Della Pizzi, Dr. Kama Candola, Glenn Rutland, and Sheila McPherson. On this issue, I'm citing the judgment I have delivered on this case on September the 13th, 2021, in which I reviewed the legal principles arising in respect to a judicial inquiry. The jurisprudence involving a court's decision to quash a subpoena prescribes the general principle that a subpoena can only be issued where the evidence sought is relevant to the issues of the proceedings. In other words, the court should set aside or quash a subpoena on the ground that the information sought is not relevant to the live issues in the dispute and there's a long line of authorities to that effect. In uh, the Canadian Metal versus Heap case, 1975, 54 DLR third edition, this is a leading case out of the Ontario Court of Appeal, and that decision reflects that the evidence sought to be elicited must be relevant to the issues on the motion if it is, there is a prima, fi prima facie right to resort to the rule providing for the issue of a subpoena. When, you, when you're dealing with a inquiry, my jurisdiction as the sole adjudicator is limited by its terms of reference for the inquiry and whether or not it is relevant to those terms. In my opinion, the terms of reference reflect that my sole mandate as sole adjudicator is to investigate the allegation that Mr. Norn breached the mandated period of self-isolation for COVID-19 upon his return to Yellowknife in April of 2021 and whether he misled the public regarding his compliance with the mandatory self-isolation period. In Mr. Norn's application, and I mentioned it earlier, that he wants subpoenas for Dr. Andy Della PZ, Dr. Kama Condola, Glenn Rutland, and Sheila McPherson. Mr. Cooper's arguments, thanks to our court reporter, appeared in last day's transcript. The first witness he wishes to call is Dr. Andy Della Pizzi, the Deputy Chief Health Officer for the Northwest Territories, to give important information on the creation, explanation, and promulgation of the COVID rules. In this case, Mr. Cooper's request is reasonable, and I'm, I'm going to allow Della Pizzi to testify, and therefore a subpoena will issue returnable at the conclusion of Mr. Norn's testimony. In my view, his evidence will assist me in the inquiry, even though the current witness on the stand being cross-examined, Mr. Dennis Marchiori, is the Director of Enforcement and Compliance and is available to question as Mr. Cooper has been questioned. With respect to Dr. Candola, however, as she is the leading, is leading the response to COVID-19 in the Northwest Territories, which now is leading the nation in cases per capita, we cannot in the public interest take her away from this important mandate. Also, it is critical to state that Dr. Della PC can answer these questions along with the witness that is currently on the stand, Mr. Dennis Marchiori. Therefore, I'm not authorizing a subpoena for Dr. Canola. 
Turning now to the request to have subpoenas issued for Glenn Rutland and Sheila McPherson, I'm assured by Mr. Cooper that the testimony he wishes to elicit from them has nothing to do with the previous matter which has already been dispensed with, and that was the judgment I wrote in respect to the allegations of institutional bias. If any evidence is attempted to be elicited in breach of this undertaking, I will make the necessary order from preventing Mr. Cooper from proceeding in that manner. I understand that Mr. Cooper also wishes to elicit evidence about how a new first term MLA would have been taught about the member's code of conduct, how to deal with the crisis, how to approach the media, and how to deal with media inquiries. Ms. McPherson is the law clerk for the Legislative Assembly and does have personal knowledge of those issues. Although I have some serious reservations as to whether this evidence will assist me and may not be within the terms of reference, in fairness, I will permit her to be heard and therefore a subpoena will issue returnable at the conclusion of Mr. Norm's testimony. As both witnesses are stated to be required for this purpose, in my view, one witness will suffice, especially when Mr. Cooper has not entirely satisfied me as to the relevance of the evidence. Therefore, I'm not authorizing the subpoena to issue for Mr. Rutland, and that's my judgment. Now we'll go ahead with the cross-examination, and Mr. Hellaby, I understand that you're going to, going to be conducting the cross-examination. Yes, Mr. Barber. Yes, Mr. Barber. You go ahead. I'm sorry, I don't see Mr. Uh, that's your in. Uh, I think he has to say something in order to, to activate his mic and the camera. Mr. Barkiori and Ms. Taylor are just coming in now. Well, thank you. We'll just, uh, we'll be able to start in a minute or so. Sure. They're present now. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Barchiori. Mr. Hallaby. You are the Director of Compliance and Enforcement Operations for the Government of the Northwest Territory, is that correct? That is correct. Can you please explain your position and your responsibilities in that role? Certainly. Uh, underneath myself as an Assistant Director, uh, and that Assistant Director has Compliance and Enforcement. Uh, with him. So our compliance officers in all the regions of the Northwest Territories. There is also a manager for highway border operations and a manager for airport border operations. And we have a manager of isolation centers as well. And those are four isolation centers and four hubs. Thank you. And can you please explain the coordination between the COVID-19 co coordinating secretariats? with the COVID service operations and protect NWT, how all three entities work together? So protect NWT is the public reaching arm of the COVID coordinating secretariat. As you uh, leave the territories and come back, a resident would uh, request a SIP through protect NWT and protect NWT would then process that self isolation plan. If there is a complaint based on something that was going on in the Northwest Territories, a phone call would be made through Protect NWT or an email. That gets put into Smartsheet and then our compliance and enforcement officers would deal with that as well. What, what would your, your role be within those three entities? Pardon me, I didn't hear the question. What is your role within those three entities? How would you be involved if there was an issue? Uh, as the director, uh, both myself and the assistant director, we triage any of the complaints that come in and provide them to the actual regional lead in the region that they're identified for. 
Um, I also work with uh, the Chief Public Health Officer on uh, the public health orders. And that's Dr. Cami Condola. That is correct. So when someone's applying for a self-isolation plan, who approves these plans? How many people does it go through? If you put in for a self-isolation plan, you can phone in to protect NWT and talk to an agent. If you have an agent, the agent can work with the uh, resident to fill out the self-isolation plan. If not, you can go online um, and fill out the self-isolation plan on the portal, and then it would go into Protect NWT. A Protect NWT worker would then uh, either approve that plan or uh, provide it up to a supervisor to review the plan in case there is a specific exemption based on the public health order. Thank you. And so if I may draw your attention to Exhibit A, page 3. Exhibit A, your original option. Correct. Exhibit A, page three, it's your original affidavit. Okay, page three. Excuse me, a smart sheet. Could you explain what uh, modify 040321 at 501 AM is referring to? So that, based on what is on page two, is it, it's reviewed and it was modified, which means that the uh, Protect NWT may have reached out to the individual to put in the self-isolation plan and asked additional questions in order to approve that self-isolation plan. Sorry, just to be clear, is that may have or is that exactly what's happening? Uh, based on the fact that I see modified by and it says automation at smartsheet.com, it may have happened. Is there any way to determine exactly what happened? I, I'm not a computer programmer, I can't answer that question. Is there anybody within your department? No. There may be someone that could answer that question. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Mr. Hellaby. Could I just ask you to speak up a little bit? Sure. What I'll do is move the microphone closer to myself. How's that? Oh, perfect. Thank you very perfect. much. Wonderful. Thank you. Bear with me for a second, Mr. Marchiori. When it comes to the uh, symptom checks, which occur uh, on the second day and so forth up until the 14th day, the department that looks into that has been, uh, sorry, is indicated as being either Protect NWT or it could be Stats Canada. Is that correct? That is correct. And if it's through Stats, Stats Canada would make the original call every time, or how would, how would that work? So Stats, Statistics Canada is on a contract with Protect NWT to provide the symptom checks. So Statistics Canada can phone the individual and request to do a symptom check, but a symptom check is automatically generated by Smartsheet as well. So if, you, if the individual is contacted, by Statistics Canada and says, I am doing all of my um, my symptom checks online. Stats Canada has the option to continue to phone that individual and confirm the symptom check, and the email continues to go out from the Smartsheet platform. And how does that information go back to any of those three entities we earlier spoke about being Protect NWT uh, and the COVID-19 Coordinating Secretariat? So Protect NWT is part of service operations. That's, it's the same entity. 
Protect NWT is the public facing name of COVID service operations. COVID service operations is one of the divisions within the COVID coordinating secretariat, which is a branch of health and social services for the government of the Northwest Territories. Now, to your knowledge, does Statistics Canada perform this service for any other jurisdiction? I can't name the jurisdictions, but I believe we were informed that Statistics Canada was doing it for some of the jurisdictions on the east coast of Canada, and that is why we looked at using them uh, starting in uh, November, December of 2020. And the scripts that were set up in your as shown in the second application, uh, under Exhibit A, for example, on page 26, were those specifically set up set up for the NWT? I, could I just interject just to confirm you're speaking about the October 4th, 2021 affidavit, Exhibit A? Correct. Yes, those scripts were developed by the director of uh, COVID service operations at the time. Okay. Now, so we're just going to jump around a second here. When someone is setting up their self-isolation plan and the days are being calculated, are, for example, if somebody was to return to the Northwest Territories at 12.01 a.m. on the 1st, when would the self-isolation end at 1201 a.m. on the first of any month that is day zero so day that one day is zero. on the second of that month and then you do your 14 days so what if it was 1159 p.m. on day one on the first of the month it's the exact same as what I just described so there'd be no difference between those almost 23 hours based on that time. So okay, the day you arrive in the territory is day zero. The next day is day one. And on the, when would the isolation end? At what particular time of day? It's done according to uh, the approximate time that you enter into the Northwest Territories. So that would be day zero, 24 hours later, you've now completed day one. And day one's there, add your 14 days. Similar to what's in the letter in the other appendix. So it's going by the hours, not necessarily the days. Is that correct? Or I'm at a loss to that question as I've explained it three times. It's quite simple. It's 14 days. First day in is day zero, and then 14 days. So again, going back to our example, just to be crystal clear here. If someone were to arrive at 5 p.m. on the first of the month, their isolation begins on the, at basically 12 a.m. on the next day. Is that correct? Isolation begins the moment they enter the Northwest Territories. They are to return to one of the four hub communities based on the December 1st, 2020 order, which is what we're discussing right now. Now, when someone jumping back, sorry, a little bit forward here, on the day 14 final symptom check, once somebody, once an operator would go through this script and there are no symptoms, would that person be completed their quarantine, their, their isolation sir? Once they're completed that 14th day. So on the 14th day, they get a phone call. They have to complete that day to whatever time that they came in. Then they're completed their 14 days of isolation. Okay, so starting at page 26 for the final symptom check, where in the script does it indicate that clearly? Could you point us to what page you're referring to, please? Sure. The Final symptom check script begins on page 26. That would be the October 4th affidavit, Exhibit A. On 
on page twenty seven of fifty two of the document under symptom assessment it says caller today is the last day of self isolation and i want to ask about any symptoms you may be experiencing therefore that's the last full day that they have to complete their self isolation now is there any indication within this script that even though we're calling you now and you have no symptoms, you must remain isolated until 11.59 p.m. Is that indicated anywhere in the script? Within the public health order, section 2A of the December 1st, 2020 public health order, it's 14 days. And as I've explained, if you're on your final day, you still have to complete that day. Okay, but is, has that been made clear to the public? There are multiple communications on websites. The public health order is available. The scripts go through it and it does state, as I've stated on page 27, that this is your final, your last day of self-isolation. I think it's fairly clear. Mr. Maggiore, given general public, do you not at least foresee someone having some sort of confusion as to when the isolation would end following that phone call? I can only speak for myself and the public health orders that I enforce. I can't speak for the general public. Did you foresee that there could be some confusion? Not based on what we just went over, thank you. Is this, sorry, uh, back to the October 4th affidavit, Exhibit A, is this document public? The entirety of that document, entirety of the exhibit A. No, this document is not public. It's an operations manual for individuals that perform the symptom check. Thank you. Are any of your departments involved in contract, uh, sorry, contact tracing? Not for uh, the COVID coordinating secretariat, that would be uh, the Northwest Territories Health and Social Services Authority or the, um, uh, under the office of the chief public health officer, there is a public health uh, CDC, which is Center for Disease Control. Those are the organizations that do contact tracing. And just jumping back here, for Stats Canada, the operators that are making these phone calls, are they employees of the federal government? Or is this work contracted out to, let's say, call centers from around the world? They are employees of the federal government, and they are under a contract with the government of the Northwest Territories based on a contract that was done in 2020. Thank you. Mr. Barkley, if I could just have five minutes. Can you say that again? Barkley? Say it again. Yeah. It will be adjourned for five minutes to give you an opportunity to review whether or not you want to ask any further questions. Thank you, Mr. Barkley. This hearing stands adjourned for five minutes until 2.30.
Okay. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I didn't know if everyone saw my message. I just had to go close down noise. That was construction outside, but I'm back. Okay, sorry about that. Did you need a minute, Madam Court Reporter? Uh, no, I took care of it. I just sent a message on the chat just in case, but I'm I'm back. Thanks. Sorry about that. Thank you. Mr. Marchiori, I'm still unclear as to the calculation of the 14 days. Perhaps another, perhaps a demonstration might be in order to clarify our understanding. I'll give you another hypothetical, and if you could please calculate the 14 days for me. I arrived to the Northwest Territories April 1st at 11 p.m. When does my isolation end? So April 1st at 11 p.m. And my apologies if I wasn't clear on this answer in the, in the past, but April 1st, 11 p.m. You, day one is going to be April 2nd, and then 14 days from that will get you to April 16th, up to and including April 16th. Does the time matter then? When we look at April 16th, we consider it to be a full day. So it's even in the letter that is provided in, in one of the appendices, um, as pointed out here, the individual came back on April 4th and has to isolate up to and including April 18th. Now the calculation you gave me before. Just a second, Mr. Barkley had a question. I just have a question is uh, you said April the 16th is a full day. Would April the 2nd be a full day? That would be correct because you've come back in on April 1st at 11 p.m. Yes, but you start the calculations on April the 2nd. It won. You've completed one day in the Northwest Territories because you finished 24 hours. That's why we consider that to be day one. I understand. That's what, Mr. Marchiori, that's still not the same though. Is, is it 24 hours or is it one day? Is it, if, if the timing, for example, on Thursday the 1st, let's, let's say it was the 1st of April, if I arrive at 11 a.m. or 11 p.m., how is that affecting the calculation? Because we calculate the 14 days as the safest example for COVID-19. And so if you come in at 11 p.m., and I'll just go through this quickly with 11 p.m. and 11 a.m. on April 1st. April 1st at 11 a.m., 24 hours is April 2nd at 11 a.m., and you have your 14 days, which get you to April 16th. So at 11 a.m. on April 16th, you are done your 14 days of isolation. So that is quite different from the answer you gave previous, in that the time is now a factor. Now, how would the... 14 day symptom check factor into that because previously if I'm unless I'm incorrect you mentioned that it's the end of the day at the 14 day symptom check now you're indicating that there's a time factor there and it's not the end of the day which one is correct sir I, we've always done 14 days from the first day you've come in so in some cases we have looked at a full 14 days to make it simple for the residents to understand that the 14th day is the full day. But you just indicated previously that in the hypothetical we gave, it would be the 14th day at 11 p.m. or a.m., depending on when the person arrived. For the first 24 hours, correct. And then we calculate the 14 days. So it's it, it works out to be the exact same time period and the and the day to cover. Mr. Chiori, in the 14 day isolation period, are the times listed as to when the isolation would end? Referring back to your affidavit of September 14th, Exhibit A, do you please point me to where that would be indicated in the letter? So in the first paragraph, and it's page six of the appendices, it Sorry, states just a, a Just a clarification, is this letter auto-generated or did somebody create it?
Pardon me? Is this letter auto-generated? Uh, individual from Protect NWT will populate it. Through a document generating program or is it fully typed out by that individual? I believe it's a document generating program. Okay. So where are the times listed on this document? That would indicate for the specific person it's referring to. So for this specific example on page six, it states that you are required to complete 14 days of mandatory self-isolation in Yellowknife starting April 4th up to and including April 18th. As the, uh, the SIP that was applied for stated that they came into the Northwest Territories on April 4th. But again, where's the time factor in this? Of the time of arrival? I believe I've clarified that, that we don't look at the time of arrival. It's just you were asking between an 11 p.m. and 11 a.m. difference. And I'm trying to explain it the best possible way that I can. So uh, my apologies if I've caused any confusion, but it states right there in the letter. I'm not going to speak for um, the sole adjudicator of his counsel, but I, I believe there's still, there was confusion with that explanation. Um, it's, if, if the first day doesn't matter and you're going until the end of the 14th day, what difference does it make if you arrive at 11 a.m. or 11 p.m.? Are you able to answer that? Are you asking me that question? Can you repeat your question, please? Sorry, Mr. Bart. Just to say. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, and I just want to make sure this is very important. And I'm, I'm going to go back to the example that you gave. You indicated on April the 1st, a traveler arrives at 11 a.m. on the 1st. Well, I understand it. I want to make sure I have this exact, is that you don't start doing the counting until April the 2nd and then you run 14 days and all of April 16th is part of the isolation period. Is that accurate? That is correct. Thank you. Now, Mr. Marchiori, in that same example, it's not 11 a.m. and 11 p.m. instead. When does the isolation end? At the end of the day on April 16th. That's the, that's the answer you're giving now, then? That is the answer I've provided, yes. So before, prior, unless you need to recount from, the, from Madam Court Reporter, there was a difference depending on which time of day. Now you're indicating that whether it's 11 a.m. or 11 p.m. of arrival, it's still going to be 14 days from the next day at the end of that day. So a person could be isolating, let's say, for 14 and a half days or 14 days and 23 hours, according to that calculation. Take an individual to isolate for 14 days after their arrival into the Northwest Territories. But that could be 14 days and 23 hours, depending on when they arrive. I would state that the individual comes in and isolates the 14 days after their arrival into the Northwest Territories. And just what, back to that example, Mr. Archery, let's say the 1st of April is day zero. Counting 14 days, would that not get us to the 15th? Fourteen. Well, the first day is April, actual April 2nd. That's, the, that's when you've done 24 hours, so you'd get to... One day. April 3rd is one day. But you just arrived on April 1st. Okay, so the Correct. first day of so that's April that's we've always calculated that as day zero because you haven't finished 24 hours in the Northwest Territories. So April 2nd is your first day of isolation, and you go until April 16th, 14 days. Uh, Mr. Adjudicator, I think my client has answered the question. Not to clarify, uh, sorry, Council, but adding, including the second. 14 days on my calculation would be the 15th. 
the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. How are we getting to the sixteenth? I think it's fair to say this calculation is actually quite confusing. It's the general public, Mr. Marchiori, perhaps more explanation is needed. Would you agree? Uh, no, I don't agree, as it's actually in the letter for the date that you have to isolate up to and including, and it's fairly clear when the letter comes out to the individual. And again, going back to the 14th day <sighs> symptom check, there is no clear indication in the script saying even though this phone call is for a symptom check and you have no symptoms you must remain isolated until the following day that doesn't appear in the script does it i believe i covered that as well earlier that it does state that you are on your final day of isolation but does it which means by that isolation? day does the script clarify specifically that you must, even though there you have no symptoms, you must remain isolated until the following day? Does it I say the following day were in that script? I feel it is clear as it is as put in the script. To the general public, Mr. Marchiori, it may not be, but that's again for Mr. Barclay to determine. And the email, sorry, to jump to another uh, indication, on the 14th day, those who are self-isolating would receive an email. Can you indicate what that email would entail or what it would communicate to the person isolating? So the email is uh, automated by Smartsheet. So if you get a phone, you can get a phone call from the Stats Canada employee, but you also get an email that comes from Smartsheet that states the symptom checks, which you would also get on day 2610. And so on day 14, you'd get the same email. If certain residents prefer to fill out the email on what they have for symptoms, other residents prefer to talk to a live person. So if somebody fills out the email and says they have no symptoms, what happens then? or it clicks the link from the email and says they have no symptoms, what would happen at that point? Then they would complete their final day of isolation and they are then, they're okay to go. Would they receive communication saying you're okay to go? Um, to the best of my knowledge, there's no follow-up email after they're done that symptom check. So they could fill in the symptoms and then if they think that's the last day of their isolation, they're, they're good to go. They don't have to isolate any further. They would actually still need to follow the direction provided to them with the approval of their self-isolation plan, which is the letter that's provided through Protect NWT, which states which day isolation is up to and including. When a when an individual who's isolating is receiving a call from Stats Canada, are those calls recorded? I do not know if they're actually recorded or not. I would have to look into that. Do you know if there's any quality assurances on those telephone calls were to ensure that those operators or those, those staff are following the script? Sorry, I believe that is part of the contract. Do you know for sure if that's part of the contract or how often it's done? I don't know those details. If someone wanted that phone call in one of the official languages of the Northwest Territories, how would they go about getting that done? So within the script itself, it states that if they want to have this done in another language, they are to access a translation service, which we have contracted through the GNWT. And how is that communicated to them? Is it communicated to them in English? It's actually, it's actually within the script, and if they ask for another language, then that individual would ask them to hold and they would get uh, the translator for that language. Thank you. Did you have any? So if they don't understand English, they can't understand the operator, how do they go about getting services in their, in their official language, which is one of the recognized languages of the Northwest Territory? 
we try our best to try and ensure that a resident can fill out the required information so if they're saying that they do not understand we will have other people within protect and bt that will try and listen to the language and try and get the proper interpreter are all the emails available to be sent in the various official languages of the northwest territories i believe they are sent in english and french but not any of the other official languages of the northwest territory not to my knowledge Thank you, Mr. March. Your little questions I have. Say something. It was muted. Pardon? Did you want to say something? It's muted. Oh, I was just uh, thanking you, Mr. Hallaby, for your services and cross examination. And uh, those are all the uh, questions for Mr. Marchiori, and we, we thank his counsel as well for being present, and uh, that would conclude your testimony. Thank you. Now we uh, call as the next witness, Mr. Brian Thagard, who I believe is present at committee room A. Mr. Thaggard is present, sir. Mr. Thaggard, please be sworn or affirmed. Can you state your name in full for the please? Uh, Brian Thaggard, and I'll affirm. Um, do you solemnly affirm that the evidence that you will provide the inquiry is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Madam Clerk, Ms. Anderson, would you assure that the witness has before him his affidavit sworn September 22nd, 2021? Do you have that, Mr. Thaggart? Yes, I do. Okay. I think we then can proceed. Mr. Thaggart, I, I want to begin with this uh, uh, warning that I am required to give all witnesses who testify. I'd like to begin by informing you that pursuant to Section 8 of the Public Inquiries Act, you do have the right to object to answer any question under Section 5 of the Canada Evidence Act. The Public Inquiries Act also provides that any witness at an inquiry shall be deemed to have objected to answer any question asked of the witness on the ground that the answer of the witness may tend to incriminate the witness or may tend to establish the liability of the witness to a civil proceeding at the instance of the Crown or any person. No answer given by a witness at an inquiry shall be used or be admissible in evidence against the witness in any trial or other proceeding against the witness taking place after the inquiry other than a prosecution for perjury in the giving of the evidence. Do you understand that warning, sir? Yes, I do. Okay. Mr. Uh, in, in your, your name is Brian Thaggard, and you swore this affidavit dated September the 22nd, 2021? Uh, Firm, yes, that's correct. Okay. Okay. And I'm, I'm going to review it now with you and read it into the record and pause when we get to the various exhibits. And for the, um, Madam Clerk, for the purposes of the one exhibit that will be shown, there is a short video that will be shown here uh, at the exhibit D. So this is the video that we will be queuing up when we get to that. 
So let's begin your affidavit. Affidavit of Brian Thagard. And I'm going to ask you, Mr. Thagard, to follow along with me and correct me if I've read it incorrectly. Affidavit of Brian Thagard, Sergeant at Arms, Northwest Territories Legislative Assembly. I, Brian Thagard, of the City of Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories, make oath and say or affirm. One, I swear, affirm this affidavit under compulsion of subpoena dated July 14, 2021. A copy of that subpoena is attached to this affidavit and marked as Exhibit A. Two, I am the Sergeant at Arms for the Northwest Territories Legislative Assembly. Given the foregoing, I have personal knowledge of the facts and matters here and after deposed to, except where so stated to be based on information and belief and where so stated, I verily believe the same to be true. Three, the names of all individuals entering the front doors of the Northwest Territories Legislative Assembly building, bracket, NWT Assembly, and the bracket, are recorded by the on-duty security guard on the legislature on the Legislative Assembly Access Control Register, the Register. A copy of the Register Sheets for April 17th, 2021 and April 20th to 22nd, 2021 are attached to this affidavit and marked as Exhibit B. Now, Mr. Thagard, I'd like to take you to your Exhibit B to your affidavit. and. And th this is the Legislative Access Control Register. And for the for the information of all all those uh, following the exhibits, the page numbers that I'm going to refer to Mr. Thaggard appear in the top right hand corner above the words page of. There is a small number. For example, on the first one I'm referring him to, the Saturday, April seventh seventeenth, twenty twenty one, you'll see page and there's a number one right above it. I hope the council has been able to locate that. Mr. Cooper, are, uh, are you following that? Yes, I am. Okay. Good. Uh, uh, okay. So, uh, Mr. Thagard, you see that page number? Uh, yes, I do. Okay. So, this is exhibit uh, B to your affidavit and this is the uh, Legislative Assembly Access Control Register. And this is for the date Saturday, April 17th, 2021, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And uh, so just generally, what is this? Is this, uh, how is this kept at, at the legislature? How is this uh, document recorded? This document is recorded by the on-duty security officer for every individual that enters the building. Their information is recorded on this access control register. So for the date of Saturday, April 17th, it appears to be three persons. Yes, that's correct. Is that correct? Right. Okay. And, and is there a security officer named uh, signing in these individuals? Uh, yes, if you note in the upper uh, left hand above um, uh, the sign in lines of information, you'll uh, see the name Brain. That was the security officer on duty that day. And that's spelled B R A I N E, correct? Yes, that's correct. And is that Mr. Robert Brain? Yes, it is. Okay. And do, do, does his initials appear anywhere on the document as well? Or, they do. or do you know? I'm sorry. Uh, yes, they do. For each of the individuals that enters the building, their information um, is logged uh, time in, time out. Uh, on the, the time out entry, uh, the security officer initials um, the, that the verifies, sorry, the initials verify the times that are entered on there and whether or not uh, keys or passes or that type of thing was issued to, to any of the individuals on the sheet. Okay. That's for April the 17th, 2021. The next page, which is number two in the top right hand corner above the page number, uh, this is for Tuesday, April 20th, 2021. Correct? 
Uh, yes, so the, my next page is page one of three for Tuesday, April 20, 2021. There's page one of three. Um, the next page then obviously is two of three and then three of three. So there were three pages uh, for Tuesday, April 20th of individuals that, uh, that were logged into the building. And who were the, the security officers on those dates? Uh, it was Robert Brain, Michael Butt, and Clay Langenham. Okay, and just very briefly, on that date, do you see any particular security officers signing in majority of the individuals? On page one of three, the uh, security officer initials are all of uh, Mr. Robert Brain. On page two of three, it looks that all the initials are of Mr. Robert Brain. And on page three of three, we've got uh, Mr. Robert Brain and uh, the other two gentlemen. There's, there's one there by uh, Michael Butt and there's three by Clay Langenham. Okay. So that, that covers off Tuesday, April 20th. The next um, document in your exhibit is for Wednesday, April 21st, 2021. Is that correct? That's page five, one of four, and where there's four pages for that date. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And who are the security officers? It'll be the same three gentlemen, Robert Brain, Michael Butt, and Clay Langenhan. Can you tell who signed in? Looks like the majority of the individuals that that day. The majority of individuals signed in uh, were by Robert Brain. On page one, is that one of four? Is that all, Mr. Brain? Uh, yes, sir. It is correct. Yes. Page two of four. Is that all, Mr. Brain? That's correct. Page three of four, is that all, Mr. Brain? Or is there uh, somebody at number seven? Uh, that's uh, all, Mr. Brain, with the exception of the one uh, by uh, Michael Butt. That's item number seven? Visitor number seven? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And then the last page, page four of four, Mr. Brain signing in how many? Uh, yes, that last page, uh, majority by Mr. Brain, and then the last third or so by Clay Langenham. Okay. That, uh, that's the end of Wednesday, April 21st. The next page, which is page nine in our exhibit, but, uh, it also has page one of four, two of four, three of four, four of four. This is for Thursday, April 22nd, 2021. Correct? Yes, that's correct. And the security officers are? Uh, Robert Brain and Michael Butt. And can you again, as you did before, indicate how many Mr. Uh, Brain signed in? On page one of four, they're all by uh, Mr. Brain. Page two of four, again, all by Mr. Brain. Page three of four, all except the last three. Uh, Mr. Brain, the last three are of Michael Butt. And on page four of four, we have uh, all by Michael Butt. I'm going back to your affidavit. Um, you say at paragraph four, the Legislative Assembly Daily Security Report, Daily Security Report, records the activities of on-duty security guards. A copy of the Daily Security Reports for April 17th, 2021, and April 20th to the 22nd, 2021, are attached to this affidavit and marked as Exhibit C. So if you could look at Exhibit C, which starts at page 13 as numbered in the document. On the top right hand corner, page 13. 
numbered, but I do have the daily assembly, or sorry, the legislative assembly daily security report for April 17th, 2021. Okay, does yours not have a number on the top right hand corner? Of page 13? No, sir, it does not. Oh, I, I, you're working from your personal copy of your affidavit, correct? Uh, yes, sir, I am. Sorry. Okay, that accounts for the. Uh, the pages are not inserted on yours. Um, okay, with that knowledge, then the Legislative Assembly Daily Security Report, uh, this is, what is this document for April 17th? Uh, I'm sorry, could you say that again, please? The Legislative Assembly Daily Security Report dated Saturday, April 17th, 2021. What is this report? What is its purpose? This is a daily report that the security guards um, uh, log their activities uh, throughout the building. So uh, exterior patrols, various duties that they're assigned to other than the access control at the front door. And who was the security officer on that day, April 17, 2021? April 17, 2021 was Robert Brain. Okay. And then the, the very next page, is the very next page a continuation of the Legislative Assembly Daily Security Report? That is the signature block for the April 17th report, yes, that's correct. Okay, and does Mr. Brain's uh, signature appear there on to your knowledge? Uh, Mr. Brain's signature is there along with the Supervisor for Security, Michael Butt, and my signature as well at the bottom. So the, the bottom signature is yours, the one that appears there, correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. Okay, so that's for April 17th in this exhibit. The next uh, Legislative Assembly Daily Security Report is at page 15 of the number, but it's stated Tuesday, April 20th, 21. Is this, uh, who are the officers on duty that day, the 20, April 20th? The officers on duty are Robert Brain, Michael Butt, and Clay Langenhan. These typically are read together with the Legislative Assembly Access Control Registers. So what the way we log and file the information is this daily security report is attached to the Access Control Register for that same date and filed accordingly. Okay. And uh, as with the previous document, is there a security officer's signature for that date? Uh, yes, sir. A supervisor is. and a man. And what, whose are they? Uh, the security officer's signature for that day was Clay Langenhan. Typically, it's the, the guard who closes the building that signs off on the report that the daily security report is open all day and each of the security officers make their entries and the closing officer is the officer to sign. So on that day, the security officer was Clay Langenham. Do you also sign this? Uh, yes, sir, myself and our security supervisor, Michael Butt. Okay, and and th do those signatures appear there on? I'm sorry? And do your signatures and Mr. Butt's signatures appear there on the document? Uh, yes, sir, they do. Okay, lastly, the Legislative Assembly Daily Security Report for Wednesday, April 21st, 2021, document 17 uh, in our book of exhibits. Uh, what, what is this? Uh, is this the security register for April 21st? Uh, yes, sir, it is. Okay, and the officers on duty? Uh, Robert Brain, Michael Butt, Clay Langenhan. Okay. And is it uh, similarly signed as the other documents on the second page? Uh, yes, sir, the security yes. officer signature is Clay Langenhan, supervisor signature Michael Butt, and my signature on the bottom of uh, facilities manager. Okay, and the, the last document in this series is the, uh, the one for Thursday, April 22nd, 2021. Do you have that? It's document 19 on those who have numbered documents. 
Do you see that uh, Legislative Assembly daily security report? Yes, sir, I do. And who were the officers on duty? Robert Brain and Michael Butt. Did uh, Mr. Brain finish his shift that day? Uh, no, sir, he did not. Sure, no. Okay. And, and do you know why? Uh, we sent him home. Um, well, uh, we sent him out for testing. Um, we felt that he, he had been exposed to or potentially exposed to to someone that had um, he had been in contact with that that potentially was a, a, a positive case for COVID. And who was that? Uh, that was Mr. Stephen Norn. Okay. And, and what date was Mr. Norn, uh, according to the documents you looked at, at the legislature? Mr. Norn attended the legislature on Saturday, April the 17th at 1447. Okay, and is, that, is that in accordance with the the Legislative Assembly control register we looked at for that date, April 17th? Yes, sir, that's correct. Okay. And where is, where is his signing in shown? Uh, Mr. Norton was signed in at number three, uh, the last uh, sign in for that day. Okay. We're gonna hear from Mr. Brain in just a minute, in just a few minutes. Uh, okay, so that covers off that exhibit, and let's go back to your affidavit. Uh, the, number four, the Legislative Assembly Daily Security Report, Daily Security Report records the activities on the duty security guards, of the on-duty security guards. A copy of the Daily Security Reports for April 17, 2020, 17, 2021 and April 20, 2021 are attached to the affidavit marked as Exhibit C. Paragraph five, the NWT assembly is equipped with a surveillance camera that records video footage of everyone entering or leaving the building. On April 17th, 2021, the surveillance camera captured the video footage of Mr. Steve Norn, MLA, entering the NWT assembly at 2.47 p.m as well as security guard Robert, Mr. Robert Brain, a copy of the recording captured by the security camera, bracket, surveillance video, bracket, is attached to this affidavit in a USB stick and is marked as Exhibit D. This time I'd like to pause and ask um, our technical people to play Exhibit D, that video of April the 17th, 2021. Could, could the picture be made larger? Thank you. We start from the beginning, please. Thank you.
I, I think it's replaying now. Okay, uh, can you hear me, Mr. Thagard? Yeah, yes, I can. Okay. Have we just watched the surveillance video that you've referred to as Exhibit D to your affidavit? Yes, sir. You say at paragraph six, the surveillance video was compiled on Thursday, May 5th, 2021, at the request of the, at the request of the acting clerk of the assembly. The focus of the investigation was whether Mr. Norn had attended the building during the time frame in question. Therefore, the surveillance video of his exit was not compiled. At paragraph seven, the surveillance video runs for three minutes, eight, three point one eight minutes and does not depict Mr. Norn leaving the NWT assembly. Paragraph eight, the NWT assembly surveillance camera system overwrites every 16 to 21 days. The video footage of Mr. Norn leaving the NWT assembly on April 17, 2021 has been overwritten since the surveillance video was compiled. Paragraph nine, the register sheets, daily security reports and surveillance video are records kept by the Northwest Territories Legislative Assembly on an ordinary basis. Is, is everything I've read into the record from your affidavit correct, Mr. Steiger? Uh, yes, it is. Okay, and and the camera that we are we are seeing that video from is that the only camera that can depict an image from that vantage point at that time, April seventeenth, twenty twenty one? Yes, sir. That's correct. I tender Mr. Barkley the affidavit and exhibits of uh, the affidavit to Brian Thagard, sworn September 22nd, 2021, as the next exhibit. Tender, I'll just get the number. That will be exhibit 21. It'll be marked as exhibit 21. Okay. The witness is now available for cross examination. Mr. Cooper? Thank you, uh, Mr. LaFerry. I'm here. Okay, that's good. Good afternoon, Mr. Taggart. Uh, my name is Steve Cooper, and I, as you probably know, am counsel for Stephen Norn. Mr. Brain reports to you as Sergeant at Arms, is that correct? Uh, no, sir, he does not. Okay. To, to whom does uh, Mr. Brain report then? Mr. Brain reports to our security supervisor, Michael Butt. Okay, and to whom does Mr. Butt report? Uh, Mr. Butt reports to myself. Okay, so Mr. Brain only reports to you in an indirect fashion through the office of Mr. Butt, correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. My understanding is that when people come into the Legislative Assembly, they're obliged to sign off on the access control register. Is that right, under visitor's signature? Uh, yes, sir, that's uh, typically correct. However, on weekends, our security staff will generally just sign folks in as they come and go in the building. Why the difference in procedure between weekends and weekdays, Mr. Taggart? Uh, the traffic on a weekend is, is much lighter, so it's um, convenient for the for the staff to do it. In the case of April the seventeenth, the um, the cafe owners likely came in uh, a rear entrance and didn't come right up to the front desk. So, uh, security officer Mr. Brains signed them in um, as he allowed them access in that back door. And then typically when the ML, excuse me, when the, the members of the Legislative Assembly attend the building, we don't have them stop and sign. Uh, we'll sign them in as they come and go, as a courtesy. Okay, do they, sorry, sir, do they have to, the, the MLAs, do they have to come up to the security desk to, to do anything on this piece of paper, the 
the access control register? Uh, they do not, but they, they typically pass by uh, close proximity of the desk and, and engage the security officers in, in conversation. Okay, so, so more of a social function than any sort of official function, an MLA might come up and engage the, uh, the security officer or officers in conversation, but, but as a function of a social interaction, not a formal interaction, correct? In that case, yes, sir, that's correct. And then I, I think we'd all agree that uh, the circumstances uh, in April of this year were anything but typical in terms of uh, social interactions, correct? I think that's a safe statement, yep. And, and we see that when we look at the video, we see Mr. Brain, who's depicted as a security guard in that video, going to the door, opening the door, and then actually walking away from the door. You saw that? Uh, yes, sir, I did. And can you imagine that sort of activity before COVID? Or would it be more likely that the security guard would remain in close proximity to an MLA to whom he's granting access to the building? Pre-COVID, that's correct. Uh, you likely wouldn't have seen, I mean, they, they obviously move out of the, the direct path of the doorway uh, previous to the pandemic. However, um, yeah, extra care is taken now to maintain distance, safe distance from folks uh, at all times, regardless of who they are. Is it a safe assumption then that when you see Mr. Brain walking away from the now open door, he was doing that to reflect social distancing? I would think so. However, uh, specifically, you would have to ask Mr. Brain. And I assure you we will. But I just wanted to get a sense of what you as Mr. Brain's supervisor, admittedly through Mr. Butt, perceives when you see that video. So you see your security guard going up, opening the door, stepping away, and actually waiting for the person coming in, Mr. Norn, to move away from the door, and then he goes to lock it. All of that, would you agree, is consistent with what the guards have been told to do in terms of social distancing? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. I just want to go back to these... Uh, access control register, you say that on the weekends because of the infrequency of visitors entering the security guards just fill out the, the signature as security, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so I think you agree with me that Tuesday, April 20th is, is not the weekend, but I see on page one, no signatures of any of the visitors, most of whom are not MLAs. On page two, I see no signatures. Again, most of whom are not MLAs. On page three, I see three signatures. The rest are simply listed as security with a few MLAs, but the majority not. Why, why is that? That doesn't seem to be consistent with what you told me was the, the procedure to be expected except on weekends. So this is another uh, COVID protocol. So uh, typically on uh, a pre-pandemic day, we wouldn't sign in staff members to the Legislative Assembly. They have uh, security passes that allow them access to come and go as required, and we typically wouldn't be signing them in. However, for contact tracing, our security staff have been signing everyone in. So these are folks that would, aren't, aren't familiar with the sign-in process that typically would never have done it. And just to make sure that we capture everyone that comes and goes for the contact tracing, our staff are taking care of that. And maybe nothing comes of it. When I look at page three of three for Tuesday, April 20th, 2021, under the Access Control Register, um, entrance number 19, 20, and 21, and the names are completely irrelevant, uh, are listed as housekeeping. And it seems that all three of them have actually signed their, their names under a visitor's signature. Any idea why that would be? In, in view of what you've described as the modified COVID protocols? Yep. Yes, sir. They are not staff, uh, full-time staff of the Legislative Assembly. They are contracted service providers. Kind of like the people that run the, uh, the cafe in-house? Same category? Yes, sir. That would be correct. Okay. So you would expect that the people that were working at the cafe, like... Uh, and again, the name is, is irrelevant, but number three, 
Cliff Cafe waitress. The security just signed her in. Any reason why that would have happened? Uh, as previously mentioned, they have access uh, through a different door that's at the back of the building that is uh, controlled by the security officer and there's a camera there. So they, the cafe staff have access through that door. Uh, upon check-in with the security officer, they don't necessarily make their way to the security desk because their place of, of employment and work is between their entrance point and the security desk. So they would just report directly to the cafe and the security officer signs them in to track that they've been in the building. Okay, so my understanding then, in essence, what you're saying is that because of COVID, the protocols have changed. People who are regularly in the building, staff, MLAs, are simply recognized and their signature is replaced by the word security. But other individuals, with some exceptions like the cafe staff, are expected to sign it. Is that a fair summary of what you've told me so far? Yes, sir. How accurate are these access control registers in terms of the time in and time out? Uh, they are very accurate. To, to the minute? I would expect within the minute, yes, they, if they're not immediately at the desk, they keep notepads with them and track on the notepad uh, timings and then transcribe it on to the, to the register as required. And, and either you or on your behalf, Mr. Bott, presumably has instructed the security guards of the importance of the accuracy of the information on the access control registers, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so it's safe to assume that when we see on the first of the access control registers, Saturday, April 17, 2021, number three, Steve Norn, MLA, place of residence, YK, self, signed in by the register, uh, by the security guard, Time in 1447, time out 1451. That should be considered accurate in your view. Yes, sir. The time in, I presume, includes roughly when they come through the front door, and the time out is roughly when they go out the same door, correct? Yeah, they, as close as possible to, to the actual time, yes. So it's very accurate. So Mr. Norn was, unless I'm misreading this, in the building no more than four or five minutes. That's correct. And that's the visit that is depicted on a video that is attached to or related to your affidavit that we just witnessed. Is that right? Yes, sir. So the timestamp on that video should disclose 1447 is the time in which Mr. Norn is coming into the building. Is that right? Uh, typically it would. However, we've had some issues with our surveillance system, power failures, miscellaneous uh, problems. So the time stamp on that was a half hour out at that time, approximately. And how do you know, sorry, sir, how do you know that it was a half hour out? How are you able to determine that? Well, based on the time stamp of the video versus Mr. Brain's recording of actual events in the access control register. And are you certain that's the actual video of Mr. Norn showing up on that day at the time recorded in the access control register? Yes, I am. Notwithstanding that there is at least a one half hour discrepancy between the written note of attendance and the video recording of attendance. You're still certain. Absolutely, yes, I am. And you're certain that the video is in error, not the access control register, is that correct? Yes, sir, I am. And how are you able to draw that conclusion? Uh, we've had issues with it before. We've investigated other uh, occurrences within the building and, and typically run into the same issue of the timestamp not, not matching up to the register. Is the timestamp on the video always wrong or just sometimes wrong? Sometimes. So again, sir, how do you know in this instance 
at the time stamp on the video, which is around 14.17 or 2.17 p.m., is the wrong time, as opposed to the notes entered by Mr. Brain on the access control register for April 17, 2021. Mr. Brain is an extremely detailed oriented gentleman and I would trust his recording of the time in and time out. Um, plus based on the uh, fact that we've had issues with that surveillance system previously, uh, I defer to Mr. Brain's entry in the access control register for that day. In fact, for all days. So Mr. Brain couldn't have made a mistake that day. You absolutely are certain that my client entered the building at 1447 and left at 1451. Uh, yes, sir. Traffic was pretty light, so I'm fairly confident that he was able to keep track. Your affidavit makes no mention of the timestamp or the potential error in the timestamp of the video. Was that something you gave any thought to as you were swearing the accuracy of your affidavit? Because you see, and I'm making reference specifically to paragraph five, you say the surveillance camera captured video footage of Mr. Steve Nor in MLA entering the NWT assembly at 2.47 p.m. Do you see that? Yes, sir, I do. Had you seen, had you noted the error in the timestamp on the video before? I had. Is there some reason that you didn't disclose that important information in your affidavit? I was confirming that Mr. Noren had entered the NWT Legislative Assembly at 2.47 p.m. Did you tell anybody about the uh, apparent error in the timestamp of the video? I had, um, I've mentioned it to a few folks, yeah. Okay, did you mention it to Mr. McCrary or Ms. Sparrow? Uh, no, sir, I did not. Who drafted this affidavit for you? I got it from Ms. Farrow and Mr. La Prairie. But you didn't bring the discrepancy between the register and the video to their attention, either one of them at any time, is that right? I did not because I... That's correct, yes. Did you eventually receive a request for the video depicting Mr. Noren's departure from the assembly? I did, yes. And what did you do in response to that request? I was unable to comply as that video had been overwritten at that time. It's not what I asked you. I asked you what you did in compliance with that request. What did you do? Did you speak to somebody? Did you look for the video? Did you instruct somebody to look for the video? What did you do? I confirmed that the video was unavailable because it had the time uh, when I had was um, the request was made of myself. Uh, the, the 16 to 21 day time frame had elapsed and there was no video. When did the request come to you for the exit video of Mr. Norn leaving the assembly? What day? I do not have that information with me. Roughly how long after you expect the video would have been overwritten did you receive that request? Again, I can't say with certainty. Who within the Legislative Assembly did you inquire about the status of the video depicting Mr. Norn leaving the assembly. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Who did you ask about the video? I, I assume that you wouldn't just go to whatever space there is or or, or computer where the video is stored. So I'm, I'm assuming that you've asked someone. Who did you ask? When it comes to copying video, I go to the machine that has the video and myself and the security supervisor work to make the copies of the videos. And did you do that in this case where, when the request came for the video depicting Mr. Norn's departure? I did not because the time frame for which the information was overwritten had already elapsed.
is there any video at all that would normally be available depicting the security desk at which the security guard stores and accesses the access control register? I believe uh, we don't have anything that would provide up close detail. We have a, a, a camera generally located uh, within the entrance hall of the building that's up high in a far corner, so it 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 pans the room. And within its field of view would be the security desk, correct? That's correct. And even if you couldn't see the detail of the faces of the people that are at the security desk, you would certainly be able to see that there was activity at that security desk, correct? That's correct. And did anybody ask you to preserve the video showing Mr. Norn, or potentially the person who might be Mr. Norn and Mr. Brain, at or near the security desk on April 17, 2021? I did not review the footage of that camera as the um, focus of the investigation was just whether or not Mr. Norton had attended the building and I felt that the video that we had provided confirmed that. Did you know on April 17, 2021 that the security camera that produced the video that we just saw was malfunctioning in terms of the timestamp? Did you know that day? No, sir, I did not. And when you copied that video before it made its way to us through Mr. LaPrairie, did you notice the timestamp differential, that there was an error with the timestamp on that day? I actually did not notice until this morning when I was taking a closer look at that video again. And I take it that the footage of the security desk is now gone forever. It's lost. You are correct, yes. Describe for me the security desk where the access control registry is kept. It's not just an ordinary office desk, is it? That's a reception desk within the, the front entranceway of the Legislative Assembly. So I just want to talk a little bit about proximity. It's an issue. So once the security guard has opened the door, and, and yes, we will ask Mr. Brain when the time comes, but I want to understand what you know of the security desk. A security guard on the inside of the desk, the working side of the desk, is roughly how far away from somebody in front of the desk? A, a, a guest coming in, MLA or otherwise. How wide is the desk? I would estimate uh, the desk is a little over two feet wide. And if the security officer on the working side of the desk was pulled right up to the desk and the person on the other side of the desk was standing immediately off on that edge of the desk, it would be a little over two feet. And is there or was there in April at least, 2021, any security protocols about proximity between security guards and others at the security desk? Yes, sir, there's room for the security officer to move, <coughs> excuse me, uh, there's room for the security officer to move their chair backward to maintain that six foot separation between themselves and people arriving at the building. And I take it, sir, that the security guards were directed to ensure that they kept that social distance? Yes, to the best of their ability. Would there be any reason why they couldn't keep that social distance as long as the guest, Mr. Norn, another MLA or otherwise, stayed on the non-working side of the desk? There's lots of room. They can back up. Right? No, no reason. No. Okay. So as long as Mr. Breen was applying the protocol at his workplace on April 17, 2021, and Mr. Norn stayed on the other side of the desk, there's no reason that they would have been in proximity to each other closer than six feet, correct? Uh, not that I can see, that's correct. Are 
Are the security guards required to wear masks during the workday? Uh, yes, they are. What do you mean you guess they are? Do you know if they are? Is there a policy? Uh, no, I'm sorry. I said yes, they are. My apologies. I heard you say I guess they are. Is that enforced? Uh, it is. I don't know if you could see in the video whether or not Mr. Brain was wearing a mask. I, I expect you've probably seen this video a few times in preparation for today. Did you notice whether he was wearing a mask or not? I believe he was. Did you ask him about that after the incident was made public? I did not. We just erred on the side of caution and when we discovered uh, the situation and had him sent for testing. When I look at the control, access control register for Saturday, April 17th, I, I, we all see three names, including Mr. Norm, who was there for, for four minutes. Other than the security guard, Mr. Brain, is it possible that others were in the building when Mr. Norn was there? No, it's not. So if somebody comes into that building, from the premier down to the, the, the newest janitor, they are going to be recorded in this register no matter when they get there and which door they use, correct? Uh, yes, sir, that's correct. So when I draw the conclusion that there were three people at most in the building between 1447 and 1451 on April 17, 2021, you would agree with that conclusion based on what you read here, correct? Uh, between 1447 and 1451, there is Mr. Norn and Mr. Uh, the gentleman listed under visitor number one. And, and Mr. Brain. And Mr. Brain, yes, sorry, that's correct. Okay, and, and you have no suggestion or no information that uh, the visitor number one would have had any interaction with Mr. Norn that day based on your knowledge of the circumstances. Is that fair? Uh, yes, that is correct. Okay, and he actually came in, I think you said or alluded to earlier, he came or presumably came in through a different entrance than Mr. Norn used that day? Uh, yes, that's correct, my understanding. And, and your understanding extends to the fact that he would probably have exited through that other door as well, presumably well after Mr. Norn had left the development, correct? Yes, that's correct. Thank you for your patience. Those are all of my questions. Wait. Yeah. I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Barkley. I have no further questions. We're now on the record. Back on the record. Uh, I thought it'd be a good opportunity to take the, uh, oh, it's a little late to take the break for 15 minutes. Okay. okay. Mr. Thagard, you you are now released. Okay, we'll break for 15 minutes. Uh, Thank you very much for your assistance. Mr. We'll be back at 4 p.m. Thank you, I'm signing off right now. This hearing, so this hearing stands adjourned for 15 minutes. We'll be re returning at 4 p.m.
convenient. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Barkley, if it please you, I would call Mr. Robert Brain, B R A I N E, as the next witness. Thank you. Rain, uh, I would ask that you be sworn or affirmed by our court clerk, Ms. Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Brain. Uh, Mr. Brain, would you like to swear or affirm? I'll swear. You said state your full name, please. I do. State your full name, please. Wentworth Brain, B R A I N E. Mr. Brain, that the evidence you shall give provide provide the inquiry today is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? I do. Mr. Brain, you're uh, joined today by counsel Toby Kruger. Is, is that right, Mr. Kruger? Yes, thanks, Mr. LaPrairie. That's right, it's Toby Kruger, uh, and I'm here uh, appearing as deputy law clerk uh, for the Legislative Assembly. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Brain, are you having difficulty hearing me? Yes, sir, my hearing is not very good. No. Okay, I'm going to move the speaker closer to me. Mr. Brain, just let us know at any time if you can't hear any of the questions and we'll make sure we repeat them. Can you hear me uh, now, Mr. Brain? Yes, thank you. Mr. Kruger, is, is that a uh, microphone? Can you hear me better now, Mr. Brain? We've got lots of time. Just take your time. Can you hear me better now? I'm testing one, two, three. Yeah. It. Uh, yes. Thank you. Okay. Please let me know if at any time you cannot hear me or Mr. Barkley or learned counsel, Mr. Cooper, um, and uh, we will stop and repeat the question uh, without any difficulty, okay? Thank you. Okay, uh, I'd like to begin uh, by informing you that pursuant to Section 8 of the Public Inquiry Act, you do have the right to object to answer any question under Section 5 of the Canada Evidence Act. Sorry, there was a the public. Okay. <laughs> okay, let me start again then. You can hear me, right, Mr. Brain? Yeah, there was just something else going on here. Go ahead. Okay, let me start again. I'd like to begin by informing you that pursuant to Section 8 of the Public Inquiries Act, you do have the right to object to answer any question under Section 5 of the Canada Evidence Act. The Public Inquiries Act also provides that any witness at an inquiry shall be deemed to have objected to answer any question asked of the witness on the ground that the answer of the witness may tend to incriminate the witness or may tend to establish the liability of the witness to a civil proceeding at the instance of the Crown or any person and no answer given by a witness at an inquiry shall be used or be admissible in evidence against the witness in any trial or other proceedings against the witness taking place after the inquiry, other than a prosecution for perjury in the giving of evidence. Do you understand that, Mr. Brain? Yes, sir, I believe I do. Okay. Now, uh, Mr. Brain, uh, I, I want to review your evidence. First of all, Mr. Brain, uh, is it true you work as a security guard at the Northwest Territories Legislative Assembly? Yes, I do. How long have you worked there? Um, as of today, 11 years. Okay. And before becoming a security guard, uh, what work did you do, employment did you have? I was semi-retired for uh, several years. Uh, before that I worked uh, for the uh, NWT government in the uh, Department of Justice. I worked uh, 
three, four, five years in corrections. I was a sheriff uh, for approximately 10 years, I believe. Before that, I was a uh, municipal enforcement officer, and I also did bailiff work on the side. And before that, I came from Manitoba, where I was a provincial park police. I was sworn in under the Provincial Police Act. And I have a um, um, diploma in law enforcement from Niagara College. Okay, thank you for that. Now, are you familiar with MLA Steve Norn? Yes, sir. I've uh, been aware of for about a year and a half now, or almost two years since we're running in. Okay. And is he a new MLA? I'm sorry? Is he a newer MLA? No, no. Okay. And so how long have you known him as an MLA? I'm sorry. How long have you known him as an MLA? Um, basically since he was sworn in back in October of a uh, year ago, two years ago now, a year ago. Did you, did you have occasion to speak with him on uh, during that year and a half? I'm sorry, we will have to repeat that. Did you did you did you speak to him at any time during that year and a half that he was an MLA? Oh yes, on a number of occasions. Now, could you tell us about the Legislative Assembly Control Register? What is that document? Not sure this is doing any good. Try that again, please. I'm going to ask you about the Legislative Assembly Control Register. Are you familiar with that document? Sure, I've filled out many of them. Okay, and I wonder, I wonder if you could have put before you, um, Mr. Mr. Thaggart's affidavit, Exhibit 21. There's a number of documents I want to show you attached to Mr. Thaggart's affidavit exhibit 21 I ask uh, Ms. Anderson to provide that to the witness An affidavit from Mr. Brian that? Taker. Yes, and if you go to the, uh, the the first the first document attached to it is a subpoena. But after that, there's a legislative access control register for Saturday, April seventeenth, twenty twenty one. Could you locate that? Sure, I have it here in my hand. Now, a, a general question about this. What function does this document play? This is a document that's filled out by the, uh, the duty officer who's at the main desk, and it represents each and every person uh, that comes into the building. Where is it located? It's uh, on a... Um, <laughs> it's in an, on the main desk at the left hand side where the officer sits right is that near the main entrance of the legislative assembly it's approximately 20 feet from the main door 20 to 30 feet from the main door now after you enter the building is there a great hall I'm sorry, after you enter the building, there's a what? Enter the legislative building, is there a great hall? Sir, when you come into the building, there's there's a set of double doors. You can step through the second door. Uh, on your right-hand side, as you're looking in, would be the great hall. Okay. And approximately how large is the great hall? It's approximately 75 feet long and a 
about 45 feet wide. And the reception desk is at the south end or the left-hand side of that facility, is that correct? Or your left-hand side as, you, as you're looking in there, just standing at the door. Now, since the advent of COVID-19, um, has there been any requirement of noting people entering the, the Legislative Assembly? Yes, sir. Um, they've implemented a program where that we try to designate every single person that comes in so we have a record of who has been in the building and at what time they, uh, they're there. So when I say the advent of COVID-19, you understand to me to be in, in 2020, the year 2020. Right. You yeah. all know that. Basically from March, the end of March on through to this date. So what is the protocol for visitors who visit the legislature in relation to the Legislative Assembly Control Register? It's, there's kind of several policies, they all fit in the same. If you are a legislative employee, you have a security pass and we get to know you very shortly. So you would just basically come in. Um, that includes the MLAs and uh, uh, contract staff. Uh, there is also uh, a group of government officials such as deputy ministers, deputy ministers who are issued passes and we get to know them and they come in. Um, we, we sign all these people in. The, the, the contract people and, the, and the, the employees that work in the ledge, we know them so we would write them in. Um, the uh, government staff members of which I believe it's six from each department have these passes. We usually ask them to write their name in because they change from time to time. Now, if there's individuals, um, guests that are actually coming to visit with an MLA or a minister, they are required to actually sign their name, um, the community they're from, and the person they're seeing. And then is the protocol any different? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Is there something else? No, that's good. Okay. Is there any different protocol for the weekend as opposed to a weekday? Not really. It's 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 basically the same. The, the fact that you have most of the time very few people in, so it's uh, it's not as complex, if I can use that word. Um, but it's, it, it follows the same agenda. Now, dealing with MLAs, what is the practice in terms of the Legislative Assembly Access Control Register with respect to MLAs? Um, we would enter their name, uh, MLA, in a, then uh, just uh, that they're in, signing into C self in that they don't really have anybody they have to report into security and then put the time that they enter and leave. Now the the main entrance to the legislative building is it through a double set of doors? That's correct. Now, there's a two doors and then a small lobby way which is about 10 by 15 feet and then the secondary doors. Are the first doors on the weekend locked? It's my procedure to only lock one and I leave one open so that people can come in at uh, all times into the, into the lobby. These okay, so second doors are in. both locked. Okay, so, the, so they're able to enter into the vestibule, correct? That's correct. Uh, and then, but they are not able to enter the building itself. The door there is locked. Yeah, they they have to uh, activate a you know, pager system, and uh, we make inquiries as to who's there, and then we come and let them in. 
Okay, and 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 so with respect to MLAs, they that's the, the that's the protocol. They can't simply enter the the second set of doors. The doors are locked to them as well. That's correct. I want to draw your attention to Saturday, April the 17th, 2021. Were you on duty that day? Yes, sir. I was uh, the only officer on for the Saturday shift. Okay, and you have Mr. Thaggart's uh, affidavit there. You'll see a number of Legislative Assembly access control registers uh, going all the way to April the 21st, 2021. I want you to turn past those. Oops. Where's Mr. Gregus? To tell you come to a document that I want to ask you a question about. That is. Oh yes, the Legislative Assembly Daily Security Report for April 17th, 2021. Do you have that in front of you? Um, no, I believe it's at the back here. Yeah, it, and uh, if you look at the top right-hand corner, there should be a number 13, page I'm number looking 13, at the top right. Legislative Assembly Daily Security Report, Saturday, uh, April 17th, 2021. Okay, okay, you've got that in front of you? Yes. And. Uh, what does that tell you about uh, who was on duty that day? Uh, the third line down, the first line is the date, then the shift timing, and then the officer on duty, and that's the only name is my name, Brain, B-R-A-I-N-E. Okay, and the remarks for that day, would, would those be all your remarks? Yes, sir, after we conduct patrols and or if something specific comes up, we do entries with a time slot as to when they happened. Okay, could you, could you review your entries for that day? I'm sorry, I'm looking at this. Is that what you wish me to do? Um, look at the Legislative Assembly Daily Security Report for April 17th and, and review your activities. Yes, I'm looking at it now. Um, the first time shows at uh, 7.37 in the morning. I uh, entered the building. I deactivated the alarm. That's my policy to try to do the very first thing I do uh, after en entering. Um, and then I know that I'm booked on duty. Uh, do you wish me to continue reading like this? Yes, yes, please. Okay, at uh, 7.45, I began my interior patrol. Um, it and uh, ended it at uh, eight zero eight fifty, so it took me just an hour and five minutes. The patrol consists of basically covering the entire building. I would leave the office, proceed across to uh, invariably the first thing you check is the mace to make sure it's there, both historically and value. <laughs> um, then proceed along checking the doors uh, into the chamber upstairs. Uh, chamber door, then across uh, and checking the doors through Committee A. I then proceed down into the executive, checking the washrooms and each door to make sure it's locked. And you just continue doing that all the way around in kind of a circle through the MLA side. You then come to the speaker's office. You uh, would uh, check his doors. The speaker has uh, washroom facilities, so I enter his office and go and check to make sure there's no leaking uh, or problem there. I would then return, I would check the uh, caucus room. We have some very valuable paintings in there, so you check those. You then come downstairs and proceed to check the uh, clerk's office, starting basically in the clerk's office itself and then working your way down to the back end. You go down the stairs, there's a, there's a back door, an exit door actually takes you out, but before you exit, there's a little lobby way that and stairs going to the basement. You uh, proceed down the basement. Uh, you do a complete area check there. 
Um, we look for leaking water. Um, there's an elevator shaft. We can check that to see if there's any problems with that. And I proceed. I usually go about a third of the way, and then I double back. I know some officers go the complete way, but I, it's not my policy. I turn and come back. I come up the stairs, and I, I proceed through the clerk's office, checking the, the I guess what you call the, the inner doors, uh, out. Then I go down, start down the back hallway, um, check the interpreter booths, um, the door to the chamber itself. There's uh, a small set of offices there for the executive, for legislative uh, research staff, I believe their title is. And uh, then I, and there's an exit door I check to make sure it's locked. I then go and check the uh, um, uh, member's lounge. I usually enter it because it has a, a water system there. Check to make sure it's a problem. Make the sure the windows are locked. Um, I then relock that door and proceed along. Check the other side of the, the chamber there for the interpreter booths. Uh, there's some pages and a storage room door. And then I head down the back hallway. There's a main AV room, the kitchen. I think uh, there's a door behind the kitchen that exits out the door, so check that. I then go down the stairs and uh, into the basement. I complete the check there, coming out at the boiler room, which is the extreme north end of the building, and I return down that hallway and back to the uh, the main office and enter that what my patrol has been. Would that be your interior patrol? For that day, that's a full your normal patrol. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, with respect to the next, don't you don't need to uh, go into all that detail. Just tell us briefly what you do. That was recorded at nine thirteen hours. Exterior patrol. What's that? Exterior patrol basically is you uh, you exit I exit out the back door, the that north end door. Check the vehicle there. Check the there's a door that goes into um, the. Um, Head of maintenance has a has an office there with exterior doors. Check that. I check our boiler plant. I then proceed check the main reserve parking lot. I then go over to the main public lot. I then check the what we call the teepee area, which is a small park. I'm looking for anything from vandalism, etc. And then we proceed down to uh, just past the uh, the museum and then return to the building and enter the reports to us. And in the document then you record other interior and exterior patrols. They would be similar to what you've just described? I should note that, that we have three or actually four vehicles and I check those doors also. One is behind the ledge and the other three are in the main parking lot. I check the doors and condition of the vehicle. Okay. And so does this document accurately, accurately correct, uh, record what your activities were that day? Yes, I've looked at it uh, and uh, I believe it covers everything I did. And if you go to the second page, does your signature appear there? Yes, at the very top, uh, it's Robert W. Green, Saturday, April 17, 21. And uh, do you recognize the signatures of your supervisor and the facility manager's signature? Yes, it appears to be their signatures. Who are they? Um, Mr. Butt is my direct supervisor, and Mr. Brian Taggart is the sergeant at arms, and he's the person in charge of overall uh, security for the legislative assembly. Okay, well, let's go back to the legislative assembly access control register for April the 17th, 2021. Do you tell me when you have that in front of you? Here, sir. Okay, you have it. Yes. Yes, sir. On, on April seventh, on April seventeenth, twenty twenty one, did Mr. Norn attend the legislature? Yes, I have Mr. Norn's name as uh, on the number three uh, listing, uh, showing him M L A Y K self entered at fourteen forty seven, exited fourteen fifty one, and initialed by me. Okay, and is that that's sh that shown as item number three or person visitor number three? That's number three, yes. Okay, and there are two other visitors. Uh, 
uh, Chris Zaholos, uh, Z-O-U-H-O-U-L-E-S, and, and a Katie Prentiz. Who are they? Mr. Chris Zubilis is the owner of the Cliff Cafe. By that, I, you know, the ledge owns the building, but he is the, the manager of the, the, the cafe itself. And uh, he's also the cook for there. Uh, Miss Prentice is a waitress for him. Okay. And uh, what time did Mr. Did Chris enter and leave the building? Mr. Zublis arrived at eleven twenty-three and left at fifteen fifty-three. And is that your notation of the time in and time out? Yes, that's uh, that's my understanding when he left. And Katie Prentice? Miss Prentice arrived at fourteen o one and was uh, gone by fourteen twenty-five. And what about Mr. Steve Norm, MLA? Uh, his time in was 1447 and I have him out at 1451. According to this document, when Mr. Norn was there, was there one or two other people there besides yourself? It would just be myself and Mr. Zubilis. Mr. Zubilis would have been in the cafe, which is on the opposite side of the uh, Great Hall. And Katie Prentice would have then been signed out before he arrived? Yes, she was there just for a brief period. Now, on April the 17th, uh, shortly before Mr. Norn's arrival, did you observe anyone outside of the Legislative Assembly main door other than Mr. Norn? Yes, I believe it was around or shortly after I got back from my uh, interior patrol, which would have been the, the 1343 interior, I noticed a, a woman, probably about 35 years of age, along with two children that had bikes and little um, push carts, I guess you call them, and they were outside uh, playing on the sidewalk. I, 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 yeah, on April 17, 2021, did you still have snow on the ground in the Northwest Territories? There was snow in the in the trees, and it was not on the main walkway, though it, was, it had been cleared. Okay. And what were the what, if anything, did you observe that the children were doing? I'm sorry. Could you repeat that again? What What, if anything, did you observe the children were doing? Um, they had, I think each had a little bike, and bikes, uh, small pedal bikes, and uh, the girl had a three-wheeler and the, the boy had, a, I think, a two-wheeler. And they also, I think, had at least one, um, I'm not sure what you call them, you stand up and you kick uh, one foot on it and you push it. And they were, they were going up and down the main walk, the walkway between the the legislative door and the roadway and also down there's a, a long cement walkway that runs in front of the building and between it and the roadway and they were on there and uh, were they in any proximity to the front door um yes uh, shortly after i noticed them the, the particularly the young boy was uh riding at high speeds towards the door and then slamming on the brakes and skidding up to the door. I, uh, when I stepped out, and I didn't leave the building, but I went to the window and looked out, and I think the mother must have talked to him because he stopped doing it. And the mother, uh, where was she in relation to the front door when you saw her the first time? I think I've seen her standing a couple of times, but most of the time she was sitting on a bench. Uh, when you leave the building, um, there's a, a bench that's approximately 95 feet from the main door out and about 20 feet from the roadway. And um, I actually had checked it. It's about 26 feet wide there, the walkway. So she was sitting on what would be your left-hand side. Now, according to the access control register you noted mr norn's time in as 1447 which would be 247 p.m correct correct where were you just before that 
time, 2.47 p.m., to your knowledge? Um, I was in the security office. Um, I believe I was on the computer. And what happened to alert your attention to Mr. Norn's presence? We have a small cell phone <clears throat> we carry on the weekends and in the evenings and during the day it's got the main access desk and uh, it rang when I answered it. Um, there's somebody identified themselves that being at the front door. Okay, so so when you answer that cell phone, can you talk to the person who's at the front door or just know there's somebody there? Yes, you can talk to them. Um, <laughs> it's not a very good sound system and of course with my hearing it's not the greatest either. Um, uh, um, usually if I hear that I'll ask are you at the front door or, or, or I just if I'm right there I assume they're at the front door and I go right to it okay so what did you do after you heard the cell cell phone ring that day they said at I think I answered it 247 at 247 yes yeah, so it rang uh, I answered it I believe I, I heard somebody indicate they were at the front door I'm not sure if I knew it was MLA Norn but either way I uh, grabbed a mask and uh, put it on and proceeded out the door. Uh, as I walked up, I could see Mr. Norn standing in the, the lobby or vestibule. I proceeded to put the key in the door. As I did this, I uh, turned the automatic doors on. Uh, as soon as it was unlocked, and the, so I stepped over and pushed the, there's an, uh, not a button to put at, activate the door. And I activated that, and then I proceeded to walk further um, up the hall, Great Hall, uh, about five to ten feet from the door, which which okay. automatically opened and allowed Mr. Norn to enter. When did you first see Mr. Norn that day? That was actually the very first time when I walked around the corner and observed him standing there. And he was standing about five and feet so from the entry door. Did you see Mr. Norn enter the first set of doors? Did not. Okay. So you did you did not see whether Mr. Norn passed in proximity to the female and two children you described? No, I did not. What did Mr. Did you speak to Mr. Norn? He came in and passed me. He went over and... Uh, sanitized his hands. I waited for the door to close. Uh, the automatic door doesn't close that right away. It takes 15, 20 seconds. It closed, I locked it, then I turned and asked him uh, if he was going to his office or was there somewhere else he wished to go. Okay, and what did he respond? Uh, he indicated he was going up to his office. Uh, I'm not quite sure what he said. It made me think that he was going to pick up a package or something. Was Mr. Uh, Norn wearing a mask? Yes, he had, I believe it was a black cloth mask. Okay. So after the uh, automatic door is shut, what did you do in relation to Mr. Norn? I uh, locked the door, made sure they were, they were cl uh, closed and locked. I then proceeded, and at this point, I my memory tells me that I basically went upstairs, but I have viewed the camera and it indicates that I went behind. So I have to assume I walked behind and, he, and entered the, the time he was there. Um, I remember thinking that Mr. Norm wanted to get upstairs and uh, so I then followed him up the stairs. Okay, when you say you viewed the camera, you mean you viewed the video of that day from the security camera? So that's correct. Okay, and we'll be looking at that uh, in, a, in a few minutes. Now, uh, so you, fo you followed Mr. Norn up the stairs? Yes. Um, Is that correct? I followed probably about five to ten feet behind him. We got up to the second floor. He kind of went over to one side. I went, proceeded through, passed him through into the reception, and then turned left and went down the hallway to his office. 
Is there any reason why you followed him? Um, I believe he was ahead of me, and just uh, the stairs aren't hugely wide, so I just... Okay, so you weren't, you weren't following him around that day, were you? No, he indicated that he had to go to his office, so all offices are kept locked, so I would have had to go up and unlock it, because uh, the members do not have their okay. own keys. Oh, so so he he wouldn't be able to open his own office door without you. That's correct. Okay. So uh, did you allow? Uh, did you let Mister Norn into his office? Yes, I proceeded to the door. I put the key in, turned the the uh, lock, unlocked it, and I pushed the door open. I then stepped to. As I was facing the door, I would have gone to my right about five feet. Uh, by this time, Mr. Norn had gone, he was following me, he had gone behind me and was down kind of looking into the window. They have very large windows into their offices. And he was looking through the window and he made an observation that he could see his glasses there, which made me think that's probably what he'd come to get. Um, I asked him if there was anything else I could do for him. I think I also asked him if he wanted his uh, CA or constituent associates office open, which is basically right across from us. He indicated no, that he'd only be a few minutes, and I turned and left and went downstairs. Did, uh, you, uh, did you see him retrieve his glasses from yes, the office? I, I, he was standing right at the door, I believe he went in. I, How far apart were you from Mr. Norn during the times you've just described? The hallway is approximately six feet across, so when he passed by me, I assume he was set towards the edge, so probably five feet in most cases. Did you stay upstairs at the beside Mr. Norn's office, or did you go back downstairs? Uh, no, I proceeded right downstairs. Okay, and where did you proceed to? When I was after uh, unlocking Mr. Norn's door, and when I got to the reception on the second floor, I was turning to go down the stairs. I heard a door bang very loudly which made me assume that Mr. Norn had finished whatever work he was and was going to be coming down so uh, and would want out of the building so I proceeded down and went to the main doors and I think I unlocked them assuming that he would be coming. I then proceeded what to... Are the, are, go ahead. Go ahead, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm sorry. Oh, okay, well uh, so, uh, was was it necessary to open the door to let Mr. Norn out? Yes, I had locked those doors before. We keep them locked at all times, and uh, if, uh, there's no officer at the front door. And uh, I unlocked it, then I uh, waited a minute or two. When he didn't come down, I then proceeded to the um, uh, control desk and started entering uh, Mr. Norn. Uh, the fact that he was here on the registry. Well, you say you were entering it on the registry. You mean the Legislative Assembly Access Control Register for April 17th? Correct. Okay. That's when you would have written time in and you would have written time out when he left? That's correct, yeah. According to that, he it was in there for f four minutes. Is that correct? Yes, four or five, it's, uh, yeah. How did you know what time to enter? Did you look at a clock or, or what? I have a wristwatch and I usually use that. Uh, sometimes I'll use the, the uh, cell phone clock. Okay, so you um, let Mr. Norn out that day? 
That's, yes. Uh, approximately 14, 15, right? Yes? Yeah. Now, can you tell us where the female and the children were in relation to Mr. Norn that day when he exited at approximately 1451? Okay. Um, Mr. Norn went out. He appeared to go basically down the middle, a little bit over, maybe two-thirds of the way over to what would be the right-hand side. Um, the children were on their bikes. The little girl came down and passed in front of him. The boy, I believe, passed on his right-hand side, and he then just proceeded. I assume he had a vehicle and went to that. Do you know how far apart, how far away those children were from Mr. Norn when you observed that? Probably they were five feet apart, or if uh, the little girl cut in front of him, I was a little concerned. I remember she was coming a little fast to cut him, but I think she was still probably five feet away from him. The young boy went by probably four to five feet on his uh, his right hand side. What about the female? She was did, sitting. Uh, how close the, did? She, she was sitting on the bench, and that would have been a. As I say, that area is about 25 feet, so she had been 12 to 15 feet from him. Did the children uh, get close enough to cause you any concern with respect to Mr. Norn and social distancing? Not, 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 no, I didn't. Uh, they were traveling at a fairly good clip. Uh, as I say, the little girl was, was moving right in front of cross room, so it was concerned kids will, you know, lose control and run into somebody, but uh, no, I did not think they were that close. To... Did you interact with those uh, children after Mr. Norn left? I'm sorry, run that by me again, please. Did you, did, you, did you interact with the two children after Mr. Norn left? Yes, sir. Um, I'm not sure exact time, but I... Uh, They've been out there for a while, and I thought, well, a nice gesture. I took them a set of, we have, for our tourists, when we, <laughs> when times are normal, we have tourist visit, and we can provide them with pins and all. So I took, which I think were the two NWT flags, one for each child, and uh, a couple of postcards for the mother, and I, I gave it to the mother. Were the uh, children wearing masks? No. Uh, neither of them? Not that I remember. And what about the female? No. No, no, not wearing a mask? Is that what you're saying? Correct. There was no masks on any of the three of them. Did you speak to Mr. Norn on his way out of the legislature I on April 17th? don't believe so. If so, it would be just like a, a goodbye salutation. That was it. Okay. After Mr. Norn left, did you do a patrol of the building? That's correct. Um, I believe in my thing it shows 1544, and that appears, if I remember right, was accurate. So it was about, we tried to do them about every hour and a half to two hours. And I uh, did an interior patrol. And did you observe anything with respect to Mr. Norn's office during that patrol? Usually when I do these patrols, if somebody's been in, I try to, uh, we don't run up and lock their doors usually right away. So in this case, I, that was my intention as part of the patrol to lock the door. Um, I always check the windows because uh, you never know what human beings are going to do. They open windows, they turn equipment on and all. So I just opened the door, glanced in, looked around, and then closed the door and locked it. And did you observe anything in Mr. Norn's office with respect to his phone? Yes, when I looked in the office, everything appeared to be okay, the window shut and all. I did note that the phone has uh, uh, the symbols on it indicating to me that the, the receiver had been picked up. Uh, 
I don't know if it had been used or just uh, checked for messages or what. I don't I have no idea. Okay. And what did you what did you assume, uh, if any anything, when you saw that the the the, the phone was linked? That that phone was displaying numbers. I'm not sure I understand the question, sir. The, the, the phone uh -huh. had this symbol on it, and, and colored lights just showing the time and and um, several of the things you can use on it. And usually those only are on when you, the phone. When you lift your phone, they come on and they stay on for, I'm not sure, half hour or maybe longer, and then the screen goes blank. And this okay. wasn't blank. Did you assume that Mr. Nor may have used his phone that day? That was my assumption, yes. Okay, based on what? Just the fact that it was activated. Okay, as you've described. Okay, now I'd like uh, for the video to be played. Uh, Ms. Anderson, I wonder if we could cue that up and play it. We're now going to be showing an exhibit that was marked during Mr. Thaggard's testimony, an exhibit to his affidavit. you stop the video there please now mr uh, mr brain can you hear me so i can sir okay uh what does this frame depict i'm sorry i did not hear that particularly what are your question my hand, please yes have you seen this video before of uh april 17th I believe I've seen it twice. Once right at the time that um, um, it be we became aware that uh, Mr. Norn uh, may have been, his immunity may have been compromised. And uh, then again, about a couple of weeks ago. Okay, and so do you recognize what uh, what is depicted in this freeze frame? It certainly is our office and all of them. the color and quality is very poor. I can't really tell you that that's Mr. Norman. It looks possibly like him though. Okay, uh, please advance the video. Please stop the video. Now, do you recognize who has entered the video here? Yes, that appears to be the actions I took at that particular time. As you can see, I came from the office, which is when you were entering, it would be on your left. Uh, I crossed over, unlocked the door, hit the power switch, and then put the on button on, and then proceed. You'll see me proceed another five or six feet or better across the hall. Okay, start the video. Stop the video. What is Mr. What are you doing and what are you observing Mr. Norn doing? I'm waiting for the door to lock. I don't believe I'm looking. I'm looking the other way. But Mr. Norn is standing by the sanitized machine. Okay. And do we, do we see the children you t testified about already in the video, at least the one with a red jacket? That appears to be the little girl, and I thought I saw her brother in the background, but I'm not totally sure of that. Okay. At that, uh, start the video, please. Stop the video. What are you waiting for there, Mr. Uh, Brain? Okay, what happened there is I stepped in and pushed the button on the PA system. What's happened is we have, uh, the system is, we'll say it's broken, but it's not working properly. And uh, what I did is I pushed the button, hoping to clear it. 
and I believe that's what it did. It, it goes to an alarm. Uh, or it can go to the alarm and I try not to let that, what I do is I push it and it just rings again and I just put it back in my pocket and let it ring for uh, half a dozen to a dozen times and uh, it's better than having this alarm sound. Okay. Uh, start the video. Uh, stop the video. What have you just done in relation to the door? Did you just lock it? Yeah, I've just made sure the door's uh, closed and locked, and I'm heading right now. I'm in front of the desk. The desk is just off, out of sight, uh, to what would be my left. Okay, start the video, please. Stop the video. Where, what are you doing now in your memory? I'm assuming, because, because I can't not... see it, but I'm assuming that I went behind the desk and entered his time that he came into the building. On the control register? That's correct. Okay, start the video, please. Stop the video, please. Now, during this period of time, is this the period of time that you were upstairs with Mr. Norn at his office? That would be correct. So you're no longer in view of the camera? That's correct also. The, the camera just basically focuses at the main door and takes in some peripheral areas. Start the video, please. Stop the video, please. There are two children we see, or two uh, individuals we see in the looks like red jackets. Are those the children you saw that day? Yes, those are the two children that were playing. Um, I don't remember the little boy having that. Sometimes the color on these uh, does not come out that clearly. I thought his was a lighter color, but those are the two children and you can if you look to the right and this you can see a block outside past it you can see the mother she's just sitting there on the bench okay please start the video Please stop the video. So do we see the children now in proximity to the mother? I can just see what appears to be red jackets and the children ran that direction, so I assume they're standing talking to their mother. Okay, please start the video. Please stop the video. Mr. Brain, do we see you now again depicted in the video? Yes, I can see myself. I've just entered the camera uh, zone. I've just coming down from upstairs. I think you probably saw me look over my shoulder to see if Mr. Norton was coming because I, I thought he'd be behind me. I, I, but I was walking up to the door to unlock it. Please start the video. Please stop the video. Had you, did you unlock the door right there? Certainly for my gestures I would. I, I can't uh, tell you I honestly remember unlocking, but I believe I did. Okay, please start the video.
Please stop the video. You you exit to the right there. Where are you going? I had obviously from the angle I looked upstairs from that door. Basically, you can see upstairs into the reception area. I uh, did not see Mr. Norm coming down the stairs or coming, so I assumed that he was going to be longer. I believe I was then walking around behind the uh, security desk over to the control desk or control officer's uh, post. <clears throat> okay, please, please start the video. Please stop. So the, the video ends at, uh, we're now re-watching it, so let's, uh, can you uh, take down the video, please? Resume the witness's view. Thank you. Now, Mr. Brain, uh, you can see the video runs for about three minutes and 30 some seconds, uh, but it does not show you letting Mr. Norn out of, of the building that day. Agreed? Yes, I, to be honest, I, 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 my usual policy procedure is, particularly for MLAs, out of respect for them and their position, I try to open the door and let them out. And I usually will unlock the door, walk through it, holding the door for them, and then proceed outside and step around kind of behind the door and let them exit. And I think that's what happened on that day, but I'm not totally sure. Do you know uh, why the video doesn't show Mr. Norn exiting? I usually, and I believe I said, you know, goodbye or wished him a good day, but that's uh, all I remember now. No, but in terms of the video that we've just looked at, you'll agree that it doesn't show Mr. Norn leaving that day. The let me repeat the question. The video that we've just watched does not show Mr. Norn leaving that day. Correct? That, yeah, I did not see him. Uh, so, Do you know why the video doesn't show him leaving? Um, no, I, I, I know very little about the camera system, so I, 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 could, I could speculate that... Uh, the time and gone on it, and it was no longer available. You know okay. Um, okay, now um, that evening, April the 17th, um, where did you go after you finished your shift? I'm sorry, where did I go when? After you finished your shift on April the 17th, where did you go? Did you go home? Yes, the uh, shift ended at uh, 6 o'clock, 1800 hours. Um, I uh, would finish my report, uh, also it's probably usually about 5 to 10 minutes or even later I left. I then went and drove over to my girlfriend's house and I had dinner with her and uh, a friend of hers, a teacher friend. Now, do either of those individuals have compromised health systems? Yes, those two my, ladies. Yeah, my girlfriend has. Um, I don't know, to be honest, I, I'm not quite sure what it is, but it's. Uh, I, I think it's an asthma problem. And the other lady had, uh, I believe it was cancer, and they removed half of one lung, so she's got one lung and another half. So it's, I guess you'd say, three quarters of a lung. Uh, Okay. And uh, so that the remainder of April 17th, you would have seen your two friends uh, that day, correct? That's right. Yeah, in, both these in ladies terms of are in their 70s, okay. I should note. 
Okay, thank you for that. They're both in their 70s. Uh, now I want to talk about the time period April 18th to April 19th, uh, 2021. Uh, were you, uh, when were you next on duty uh, after April 17th? Um, since I was on the day uh, shift, uh, Saturday was my last day, and I had Sunday and Monday off. Okay. And w w where were you uh, on your weekend off? I spent most of my time in my apartment. Um, I think I did laundry, which I have a laundry on my floor just down the hallway from me. I may have checked the mail. I don't believe I went out. I don't think I went shopping or anything. It's the best of my memory. I think I stayed in. How many people would you have encountered during that weekend? Other than possibly a few people within the building, uh, that would be it. I think I had no friends or guests. Okay. And the, the next day you were scheduled to work, I think you said, was Tuesday, April 20th, correct? Correct, yep. Okay. And did you work that day, April 20th? Yes, yeah. I started my shift that morning. Um, I don't have the control sheet here, but it's there. You, I took the to alarms off at 5.23 in the morning, so yes, that would be the time I... Okay. So you're looking at the... Uh, you're looking at the Legislative Assembly Daily Security Report for April the 20th, correct? Correct, sir. And uh, you uh, act deactivated the alarm at 5.23 hours and booked on duty, correct? Yes. Okay, and other officers with you that day, who, who were they? I was working the, um, the morning shift. It starts officially at six o'clock, but we're usually there. They like us to have the building as open as possible for the six when the members come in. So at 5.23, I went through. Um, Mr. Uh, Butt, my supervisor on this particular day, showed up at a, uh, just before seven o'clock at 6.50. He booked on, and uh, then my shift ends at two o'clock. And just before, at about twenty minutes before, Mr. Clay Langenham, who was the evening shift or late afternoon shift uh, security officer, he came on duty then. Okay, this was a, a weekday. How many um, individuals did you sign in uh, on Tuesday, April twentieth, twenty one? Okay, I'm now looking at the Elizabeth Assembly Access Control. There was, uh, it, uh, if you look in the corner, it says number of pages, uh, and it's one of three. So there was three pages that were uh, active. I signed in on all three pages. The only uh, of the names, I didn't sign in the last four people. Uh, three of them are, are cleaners, and one of them is a member of the clerk staff. They were signed in by Mr. Clay Langingham. Otherwise, I signed in virtually the rest. I noticed there's one or two here that uh, um, Ms. Polly Chena is a minister. She was signed in by, I think it's Mr. Butt. And uh, that's it. I signed in the first two pages. It looks like I signed in everybody. And it was just that last page that Mr. Butt signed in one person, and then the other four were by uh, Mr. Langham. According to my Matthew. My math, you would have signed in uh, approximately 66 people that day. That uh, probably is correct. There's 24 names per page, so yeah, that's two and a third, two thirds of, of a page that I did sign in. So yeah, that would make sense. And did you you signed in uh, seven MLAs? Um, I. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember individually, but I know I was the one that made up that uh, individual report about it, and those are the statistics that I came up with. So uh, if those are what you're reading from, then yes, that's the ones that I signed in. And did you uh, sign in three ministers? Yes. Looking at this, I can, I can see uh, one minister. I 
just see one minister right now, but I'd have to do it, spend more time looking at it. But yeah. Uh, oh, here's two. Yeah, okay. Shane Thompson, Karen Wozniak, and, uh, and Polly Gina. Yeah, so there's three uh, ministers signed in. Yeah. And did you sign in Premier Cochran? Sorry, the prints are uh, rather small on this, so it takes me a minute to uh, determine the. You look at page three of three just to help you out. Item number two. Oh yes, second from the top. Sorry, it's actually my bad rating that I can't read. Premier, yes, she's number two on there. Carol Cochran, Premier herself, signed in at nine o'clock in the morning, and out at three o'clock in the afternoon. Okay. And how how far away would you have been from these people as you signed them in? When you come into the uh, the ledge, as you go by the the, the Security desk is a bit of an angle, so you have a tendency to go by it. There's, you either can go up the stairs, or you go into the clerk's office, uh, the elevator there. That area is probably maximum about probably 15 feet across. Most of the people probably pass within five to 10 feet of the desk. A few maybe further out, some closer in a sense that they uh, may not have had a mask and they would come to the desk and pick up a mask. Um, and I'm not sure anybody that had to sign in would of course had to come right up to the desk, but I don't see anybody signing in on those days. So in addition to the 66 people uh, you signed in that day, you would have also been um, near your fellow employees, Mr. Butt and Mr. Lang Langenham, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, they're, they're fellow employees. I should make a note that uh, Mr. Chris Zublis, the cook, he usually comes in the back door, so he would not unless he particularly came up, and it's not uncommon for him to come to the front desk and just let us know he's there, even though we're, we're the people that buzzed him in, like he came in at 622. Um, uh, Mr. Derek Jerichon is the uh, deputy uh, sergeant at arms, and he has his own keys and all. He sometimes comes in that way, so... Um, but otherwise, everybody else should have come in through the front door. What about your off-duty hours on Tuesday, April uh, the 20th? Do you know what you did then? I'm sorry, could you run that by me again, please? Uh, your your off-duty hours after you were on duty on April 20th, 21, what, were you, what did you do to your best of your memory? Usually I, I go home. Um, sometimes I go and get groceries. I think on Tuesday I went and uh, got some groceries and all. I went to the grocery store and then I went home. Uh, do you have any estimate of the number of people that you would have encountered in your off hours on April the twenty, April the twentieth, twenty twenty one? I believe I approximation. Yeah, it's uh, difficult in you're in a store, you walk by people, people there, um, um, 20, 30 people maybe in total. If that, they, I know the, the grocery stores are not, were not very full at the time, so that may be even a little, bit of an overestimate. Okay, let's not, uh, now talk about Wednesday, April 21st, 2021. Was that the day you worked as well at the legislature? Yes, that's correct, yeah. And do you have before you the uh, Legislative Assembly Access Control Register for April 21? Yes. That's 2021. Right. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. it okay. shows me booking on duty at and 524. Okay. And as we did with the April 20th date, can you tell us uh, the number of people approximately you would have signed in? 
using the records of the ac legislative access access control record I'm noting at the uh, the pages indicate that there was four separate pages were signed out uh, right down to the, it was actually all completely filled um, I did almost all of them uh, except Mr. Butt did one uh, actually Mr. Butt signed uh, Ms. Cochran in at 9.31 and um, then at uh, six and at fifteen hundred hours, uh, it looks like Mr. Langham signed a couple of people, a bunch of people in after that. So yeah, it would be so, uh, it would be three times twenty-four, which is what seventy-two plus then another uh, fifteen on top of that. Less than so was around signed in. 86 people, 85, 86 people, correct? Uh, yes, I believe so. Was there anything on that particular day um, uh, in terms of a press conference on April 21st, to your knowledge? Yes, uh, the records here show that at uh, 11.32 we had a press conference with uh, the Premier, the Minister of Health and the Chief Medical Officer and um, there was also a number of media staff there and um, on my report it shows seven GNWT staff such as uh, they would be consist of um, the Minister's Executive Assistant, uh, the Premier's Executive Assistant uh, people from the press uh, office, the Premier's press office there. Uh, and then I believe there was a couple of Kofoid people there, uh, uh, their staff. And to give that answer to me, you were referring to the Legislative Assembly Daily Security Report. Correct. Correct. Yeah, for April 21st. For April 21st, thank you. So was it a busy day at the Legislature or not? I'm sorry, sir? Was it a busy day at the legislature or not? I'm still not copying that. Was it a normal or a busy day at the legislature? There's four sheets signed out and their complete sheets would indicate to me that it was a above, nor above busy day. And also anytime you have a press meeting, uh, it gets busy even, even in the time of, uh, that we're in now, they, uh, it, it's busy. Okay, after work on the 21st, uh, would you estimate how many people you came in contact with and where? To be honest, right now I can't think of any. I, I, I'm not sure if I went straight home or not. I, I don't remember right now. Okay. And for Thursday, April the 22nd, was that a day that you worked? Yes, it was. Did you work a full day on April 22nd? Uh, no, at approximately uh, 11.30, between 11.30 and 12, um, Mr. Taggart, uh, my overall supervisor, came and advised me that uh, there had been an indication that uh, someone had been in contact with uh, um, Kofoid, and uh, therefore I was uh, a direct contact, and therefore I would have to leave. I was going to have to get... Um, uh, tests done and then I was going to have to isolate and I believe I left uh, the building at about 11.55. Did they indicate to you who that contact was? Yes he did, yeah, it was his, the name he and gave who was, was MLA Steve Norm. Okay, and were, were you told the, the day that you would have come in contact with him? Yes, he asked me if I was working on the Saturday the 17th, and I confirmed that I was. Okay. And on the 22nd, you worked till the time you just indicated, but uh, you, you signed a number of people in that day before you left your shift, as, as indicated, correct? Early. Yeah. I, um... And can you... Can you refer to the access control register and indicate how many people you would have signed in on Thursday, April 22nd, before you left your shift early? 
I'm looking at that registry and the last person I signed in, I'm on page three. Uh, it would have been uh, the 21st, it was Martin Goldie, the Deputy Minister of uh, Indigenous Affairs, who uh, works for the Premier, and that was 1154. Uh, I remember being rebuked and told I can't do that anymore, I should not be dealing with the public. So I stopped and left. <laughs> You were rebuked by who for what? Well, um, we were very busy with things and I stepped out to do what my job was and I was told no, that since I had had the contact I was not to see anybody anymore in the building and I had to go. Um, I guess that's when it really so struck my math. me. Okay, so, uh, we'll come back to that in a second. So by my math, on Thursday, April 22nd, um, up to the time you were asked to uh, discontinue your shift, you had uh, signed in 69 people. Sounds correct. Okay. Uh, so you were you were sent home for work, from work at 11:55 a.m. on April 22nd, correct? That's correct. Yeah. Were you given any direction about self-isolating? Yes, I was told that I would have to self-isolate immediately, that I was to go home, I was not to stop off, shop or do anything. And uh, at the same time, Mr. Taggart made arrangements for me to go to the test center, which is out by the uh, airport, and actually made an appointment. And they were basically, from what I understood, waiting for me when I got out there and I was tested. Uh, both what they call a quick test and then a long test. What were the results of the quick and long tests? The uh, the quick test they can uh, they can check it right away. It takes about fifteen minutes, and they advised me that it was negative. Uh, the long test I believe has to go to Alberta down to Edmonton, and it's uh, done in a lab. And that took me I think three possibly four days before I was notified that it was negative. And did you have any uh, health difficulties while you were self-isolating? Well, I thought I kind of had an idea what it was about because my girlfriend had had to go to medicals and uh, I had been kind of her contact through that. But uh, it, it's it's difficult just the, the doing the straight thing. I also had um, a minor medical problem and I believe it was the Sunday uh, about a week and a half into it, um, uh, yeah, I don't uh, remember the exact date. But it was a Sunday. I uh, I started developing a cough, and it seemed to progress. At first, I just thought it was I have asthma, um, which or, or, uh, allergies is a better way, and uh, I thought that was it. But on the Sunday. Late in, the, late in the day, it got really bad. At one point, I was having extreme difficulty in breathing. I literally had the phone in my hand. and was at the point of dialing 911, and I was pacing up and down, and I started to cough, and I really coughed a lot and loud, and it seemed to clear up. And after that, I was better. Um, I it was being checked daily by nurses from the health center, and... Uh, <laughs> didn't confess right away. I think it was the Tuesday I told the nurse and uh, she immediately uh, made an appointment for me to come in and see. Uh, they have a doctor who's a COVID specialist. I went in and saw her and after she did ran two more tests again, she, uh, in discussion, she came to the conclusion that I probably had a touch of the flu, which apparently was going around at the same time. And uh, the tests, the two tests, a quick test and a long test, uh, eventually turned out to be negative. So. Okay, so all the and is that the sum total of the tests you had then in your self isolation? That's that, yes, that's it. And they all the results were negative for COVID nineteen. Correct. Okay. Those are all the questions I have for this witness at this time, Mr. Cooper. It's getting late. I see it's about five twenty. I'm contemplating a journey now and then 
conduct your cross-examination of this witness tomorrow morning when we had started at 9.30. Is that fine with you? Uh, yes, sir. We had uh, anticipated that at around uh, an hour ago. It's been a long day. How long okay. was it? I said it's been a long day. Oh, yeah, it has been a long day, absolutely, sir. So we're content with uh, adjourning the cross-examination as long as uh, and we have the benefit of uh, counsel here for the witness, that the, the witness is counseled with respect to the fact that he is mid-process and he's not discussed this evidence with anybody, including Mr. Kruger, until the conclusion of the cross-examination. Is that fair, sir? You, you've heard that, Mr. Brain, that's the general rule once you've... Uh testified and you haven't been cross-examined you're not to talk to anybody about the evidence uh, un until you have been cross-examined understand that correct i will keep my own comments <laughs> we're going to adjourn until tomorrow morning at 9 30. thank you sir Ms. anderson this court is now adjourned until 9.30 tomorrow morning. I'm sorry, this hearing is now adjourned until 9.30 tomorrow morning. Thank you. Thank you.